Hello and welcome once again to another episode of Interesting Stories in History Diagnostics. This is Mickey Day for Alteris Associates. And today I'm going to talk a little bit about cancer. And I'm going to split this up into two episodes. And in the first one, I want to talk just a little bit about the history of cancer, cancer diagnostics in particular, and then work that's been done since the early days of biotech that I think will be kind of interesting. So cancer has been known for a long time. Cancer has been around for a long time. As a matter of fact, in 2003, the first evidence of cancer in dinosaurs was found, which is very interesting, in fossil record. In 1932, Louis Leakey actually found evidence of cancer in Homo erectus and also in Australopithecus, and uh, that was quite interesting. So it goes back to like 4.2 to 3.9 million years in our hominid ancestors, which is amazing. More recently, of course, uh, we would expect, if you're going to find any place, it's probably going to be in Egyptian mummies. And in fact, at least six uh, different cases have been found over the years, leading back to 1,500 to 3,000 years ago. And they've included evidence of prostate cancer, evidence of uh, leukemia in a small child, and colorectal cancer in an elderly man. So people recognizing it as a, a disease, a really series of diseases, by the time we get to Babylon, With uh, the Hammurabi Code, they actually now have laws indicating that there's a fair price to be paid for removing a tumor. By the way, it's 10 shekels, which I think is rather interesting. So it was encoded in the law. And then the golden era of medicine in ancient Greece, Hippocrates actually recorded that there was an apparent difference between a benign tumor and a malignant tumor, as we would call them today. That was a uh, very interesting observation, but he still thought it was associated with the uh, imbalance of the four humors. So not too much progress yet. Then some interesting observations that occurred much later in history. For instance, in 1713, there was a physician named Ramazzini in Italy who recognized that there was an odd situation where nuns didn't seem to get cervical cancer, but got high rates of breast cancer. He couldn't figure it out. And of course, uh, we have better understanding of that today, including uh, the infectious nature of cervical cancer and sexual intercourse, but also uh, hormone imbalances. And then the first situation where it's been recorded that someone recognized it was a carcinogen that could cause cancer was with a Dr. Pott in England in 1761, where he recognized that the chimney sweeps were getting scrotum cancer and he believed it was associated with the fact that they would often have dust from the chimneys stuck uh, in their leg scrotum area, and he believed that led to the cause of that uh, particular disease. We started to get a bit more understanding of the nature of the disease later in the 19th century when Rudolf Virchow, who is considered the father of cellular pathology, recognized that cancer cells seem to be derived from other cells. These are abnormal forms of normal cells. That was quite an insight. From the 19th century forward, we start getting a better understanding about not only disease state, how to treat it, and then ways to diagnose. And that's where I'd like to transition now. But before I do, I'd like to give you a quote from an unlikely source, which I find rather interesting and I think pertinent. And that is, he said, doctors say that the beginning of a severe fever is easy to cure, but difficult to detect. In the course of time, not having been either detected or treated in the beginning, it becomes easy to detect, but difficult to cure. Well, he was talking about a fever, but this is, in fact, Niccolo Machiavelli, yeah, and this is in his book, The Prince. Of course, he was thinking about this in a different context, but I find it a very interesting quote and, and quite useful because that's the problem we've always had and continue to have with cancer. I'm going to talk a, a bit about early diagnostic tests that were developed, uh, but uh, also want to recognize the fact that we still are in a situation where we would like to be able to detect it very early to have a greater chance of making a difference. The first significant screening test for cancer was developed in 1923, called the PAP test, which I'm sure most of you have heard of. It was developed by a George Pamela Colau in 1923, and it really wasn't accepted by the medical community for quite a long time. In fact, it wasn't until the 1960s where the American Cancer Society put it in its guidelines that it started being used. From the 1950s on, 
people were using x-rays uh, to take a look at uh, people suspected of having cancer. That didn't really turn into standard uh, use until 1976 with the acceptance of mammography as a routine methodology in, in uh, breast cancer. Since then, of course, there have been a lot of other technologies used, mostly as a means of visualizing a tumor, being ultrasound, CT, PET scans, MRI, other technologies. And they've gotten better and better. But I don't want to uh, talk about those today. I think they're very fascinating, some uh, really remarkable recent advancements. I want to talk a bit about blood tests for cancer. And that takes me back to the mid to late 70s. And this was a time, of course, when we're starting to see significant advances in biotechnologies. One of those technologies, of course, was recombinant DNA, uh, ability to modify DNA uh, in such a way that you can change the expression levels of particular materials in uh, engineered cells. And then monoclonal antibodies were developed in 1975. That was a major step forward in the development of appropriate reagents for cancer. So I, th I think a key step in the history of diagnostics for uh, blood tests in cancer was the founding of the company Centacor in 1979. It was started by Michael Wall, who was an entrepreneur in the Boston area, and also a, uh, a very well-known researcher at the time named Hilary uh, Kaprowski at the Wistar Institute. And later they brought in Herbert Shoemaker, who was the uh, CEO. And amongst them, they had a desire to use these new methods, recombinant DNA and monoclonal antibodies, to develop assays for a number of different diseases. They really were focused on diagnostics early on. They had the idea that uh, it should be possible to use these techniques to find biomarkers in blood that could be used to diagnose and monitor cancer. So they started out thinking that they were going to discover a lot of these uh, things themselves. They had a small group of, uh, of researchers, but they came to realize a couple of things. One is that it's very difficult to do these things on your own. Um, and I'll give you a very interesting quote, I think, from Michael Wall uh, that he gave to Forbes magazine in 1985. And what he said was, you can have a garage full of PhDs working on a project, and nine out of 10 times, some guy across the street is going to come up with a discovery that beats them all. So very interesting, I think, and uh, uh, really true. That led him to recognize that it's going to be best if they work with other researchers outside of their own set of people to, to find these uh, uh, discoveries and bring them in. The other thing that he recognized was that it was going to be very difficult to compete with the big companies out there. And at that time, it was two major companies. It was Abbott Laboratories, and it was also Warner Lambert. And those guys had developed platforms. They were developing proprietary tests that they were putting onto their platforms, and they really had such a head start. It didn't make sense for Senecor to come up with their own independent platforms and put their own tests on that. So their idea was... Sooner or later, those guys are going to want these tests from us. They're going to put them on their platforms, and that's what they'll do. So Centicor developed a relationship, for instance, with the uh, Dana-Farber Cancer Research Institute because they had found that they had uh, discovered some antibodies that seemed to react with cervical cancer cells. And that panned out nicely over the next couple of years. They actually developed a test, which is called the Cancer Antigen 125 test. They did this as well with pancreatic cancer with a uh, CA test called CA199. And later they developed a series of antibodies for uh, breast cancer. Uh, one was for an antigen they called 15-3 and the other was called 27.29. Uh, they then also, as they expected, were able to convince Abbott over time to license the uh, 199 uh, assay from them. So uh, that plan was working pretty well. With time, Senecor got into a lot of other types of assays, and uh, they spread into th therapeutics as well. And uh, they were eventually bought in 1999 by J&J, &J, and it's now what is uh, referred to as Janssen Biotech. So I think that Senecor actually set the stage for making people believe it's possible to find proteins which are associated with cancer and develop assays for those proteins. Uh, I think before that, there hadn't been a lot done. We didn't have the right tools. Uh, so they were able to make the proteins, able to isolate antibodies against them. Uh, that all became 
something that was considered to be possible to do. As a matter of fact, I know when I was at Chiron years ago, uh, we had the belief that we should be able to find the uh, types of markers that they were able to find. Uh, and a lot of other people working on it as well. But I think it's a little surprising that there haven't been that many great cases where we've got these protein assays that are routinely used. So I'll give you some other examples. Alpha fetoprotein, which has been around for many years now as well. That's used mostly in liver cancer testing. Another is what is called carcinoembryonic antigen, CEA, you may have heard of. That's being used in colorectal cancer. Uh, they are using it to potentially diagnose recurrence and monitor treatment. And then we've got HE4 in ovarian cancer. Those tests may help determine treatment options, monitor recurrence, and measure response to treatment. So, you know, a lot of these things were considered to be potential screening markers early on. They haven't been as useful that way. They're more centered on people that have cancer than they are on people who don't. Uh, there are lots of examples where that's not the case, but it, it ended up being a different use than I think a lot of people believed. One that I recall from uh, way back then was uh, what was referred to as nuclear matrix protein. It was another company in the Boston area. It was called Matritech. And that test finally was used for bladder cancer, uh, initially in diagnostics, but also in uh, tests that may measure response to treatment. So you see a sort of a theme there, you know, some of these markers that are associated specifically with the tumor, you know, if they're present in the blood, that means that you either are not responding well, or perhaps it's recurring. There are a number of others, you know, there may be 10, 15 that we have like that, but it just hasn't been the case that we found great markers that are protein based that have the performance characteristics that would make them useful in screening in particular, early detection. There's a whole massive effort now though, to do that in other ways. I think the use of proteins is certainly not over. There are a number of ways that people are looking at this. One, all the tests I just mentioned were single tests, single markers. And we know from many other experiences that multiple markers together give better performance than anyone alone. Um, also, the concentration of, of some of these proteins that may be associated with the cancer process are very low concentrations, which were lower than what could be detected with some of the newer technologies available today, particularly so-called digital amino assays. I think there are technologies being developed and that we will start seeing where more and more effort uh, is going into proteins and they will be uh, found to be useful in ways that we probably don't even imagine right now in cancer. Next time, I'd like to talk more about the new things that are going on. Uh, some of them are quite new, some of them are not very new. but genetics, uh, epigenetics, uh, exosomes, a number of other technologies that are associated with detecting markers, uh, usually in blood, that uh, can be used in different ways and we've been able to use them today. There's so many ways in which people wanna be able to use cancer markers in early detection, uh, secondary screening, focused screening of, of one type or another, uh, therapy selection, therapy monitoring, recurrence, you know, all these things have, a, there's a great need for all of them. And we don't necessarily have the best markers available today to do just that. Now, all of that's going to still be coupled with imaging technologies of various types, but um, they will be complementary and I think continue to be important together. So I hope you found this interesting and, and useful. You know, I think uh, the Senecor history is kind of getting lost uh, in history, if you will. I think they deserve a lot of credit for what they did at a time when a lot of people probably thought that it wouldn't work, but it did. And it's used today. All those markers, by the way, are still being used uh, in all, over all this time. I think that's quite remarkable. Led a lot of people, including myself, to do things that we probably wouldn't even have thought of doing, quite frankly, until we saw what they were able to do. So next time I will talk more about uh, cancer diagnostics in a very different way and uh, hope you listen in. Thanks very much. This is Mickey Yerde for Halteris Associates. Bye.